Well, good evening, everyone. Please keep talking amongst yourselves, and for Lord's sake, don't stop eating, because I don't, I don't want you to stop uh, enjoying yourselves. Uh, perhaps just from a personal point of view, I just echo what several people have said today. What a super job Imogen has done in bringing us all together. And, uh, so, what I'm going to say is unscripted. I haven't got any notes with me. I was told to make some notes, but I thought I'll see what today brings and see what that prompts me to say. Just to set the scene, who am, who am I? My name is Richard Cumberland. I'm 72 years of age. I felt very old earlier on when somebody talked about their parents or grandparents taking cod liver oil. Well, I used to take <laughs> cod liver oil capsules that maybe one or two others of and, and viral. Um, and we used to keep our uh, vitamin D up because we still used to see children with calipers. And unfortunately, you see a few of them around now. So that's, that's my age. Um, what's my background? I um, have d degrees in, in different subjects. I've got a degree in pharmacy and I've got a degree in law. And you think, well, how do they go together? They don't really go. But one of the things I was thinking, well, in each of those you have to be careful to get things right, because at least in the first one, you get it wrong, you kill people. Um, but what it also does is that it means that I try to think of things and come to conclusions objectively. That, that, that's enhanced by the fact that I suppose I sat as a magistrate for 29 years and uh, tried to uh, reach conclusions about things on the evidence. So I hope that I'm objective. On the other hand, somebody else in the room might say, well, it actually makes him pretty picky and pedantic, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, there we are. I am at stage four. I consider myself very lucky because I've listened today to the treatment and the experiences that some people have had, and I have to say that my experiences have been in stark contrast to that. I think I've been lucky. I think I've been lucky in various ways. But I try to take some positives out of things. And one of the positives is to talk about the staff within the NHS, and we are talking about the NHS, that I've come across. Just to say where I've got to, to reach today. In, in early 2013, I had a primary uh, melanoma on my back which, being a man, is quite a common place. I didn't see it, of course, my, my wife did. You tend not to look at your own back, do you? And she spotted it, and we described it, looked in the mirror, I thought, looks a bit dodgy. So I went along to the GP, who also thought it looked dodgy, immediately got me, uh, checked him. Within a couple of weeks, it had been seen, and with another couple of weeks, it had been um, excised. And then... Um, they had another go a couple of weeks later because originally they thought, well, one centimetre round and they did two centimetres round. So that was all done and dusted. Um, as far as they knew, they'd got everything out. I was immediately put on a programme, though, where I saw dermatologists regularly, specialised nurses. I saw them um, every three months. Um, I was regularly, regularly seen, thoroughly seen, told that I was available to contact them at any time. Um, also, my GP um, immediately, she, she'd been able to spot what was wrong. She's kept in touch thoroughly throughout, so I'm, I'm grateful to them, and I'll say a little bit more about that and what happened a bit later. But a year, year on from that, in um, 2014, um, I noticed that there was some involvement with the lymph nodes. I had a, a, a biopsy and a, then a, a level five dissection of the lymph nodes. It was then said at that time that it was confined to one lymph node out of, I think it's 19 at the end. And, um, but there's some extra capsular leak, so it was put on notice that there may be a, a, a problem. Um, at that time, I was referred on to um, the local um, professor of uh, oncology and uh, he said well you're in stage three you see there is some thought that one of the new drugs which is vamirafenib uh, was um, 
instrumental, effective in stopping things um, going on stage four. So would I like to be part of the trial? So, which I said, yeah, I'm absolutely part of the trial because it doesn't help me, it, you know, it might help, help somebody else. Uh, I was screened over the next three months, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, during the screening, they found that I wasn't suitable because I was susceptible to one of the side effects of vermiraphanib. And then I found that um, I was in the September that I oh, there's something wrong here, and it was an involvement of the trapezius muscle, back of the shoulder. And um, I was looked up by somebody who says, Oh, it's right, if it's the muscle, we can operate on that. But I had a CT scan, and um, Unfortunately, it was not only the muscle there, but in my spine, which meant that surgery was not an option. But um, what it did mean was that I was immediately put on vermiraphanib. And um, where are we, Friday? Wednesday this week, I went along and saw my oncologist, and I'm now on my 23rd four-weekly cycle. So I'm extremely fortunate, because the prognosis at the time when I was stage four was then were sort of six to 12 months. So we thought I was going to be dead at least a year ago, so I look on every day uh, uh, as, a, as a bonus. And one of the, the good things that have happened to me during that time, one is the, 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 the staff, with virtually no exception, have been helpful, they've been informative, they've been interested. We're very lucky that... Um, the department where I go, and I've met somebody yesterday, yesterday who goes to the same place, and I was talking to him about it. Um, when you walk into the department, you see two lovely smiling faces of the receptionists, and that sets the tone for the whole thing. Unfortunately, one of them, she's so good at that, she thinks she's going to be a teacher, and she's actually left today. But that sets the tone for the whole department, and everybody has been... Um, extremely good. I was, I was given um, the number of um, uh, a, a, a nurse who was dedicated to me and who I can uh, uh, contact uh, at any time. Um, my GP has also been fully supportive throughout that time. Slightly more confusing is sometimes the information that you're given. Now I know that um, the professor that I saw, he said, well, what do you want to know? Well, me being me, I want to know everything. But it's quite difficult for them, actually. I can empathise because they don't want to overload people, perhaps who are, are going to struggle to absorb the information, and it might be more upsetting than others. But I prefer to know what I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with and can uh, therefore know what I've got to face. But, we, uh, but you get the information in, <coughs> in various ways, and one or two... Things where information was given to me once in an inappropriate way. He didn't mean it, poor lad. When I went in to have my um, dissection here, the nurse that prepared me, a Filipino chap, lovely man, and he said, he got me all ready, and he said, right, now, you have the operation, and then afterwards, I will see you on the other side. I said, <laughs> sorry, I said, when you're talking to elderly English people, I don't... I think that's perhaps what he meant was to have a pre-op and a post-op side of the world, but at least I was able to maintain uh, my, uh, my, my sense of, uh, uh, of humour there. The other time when I, I got information um, in, in a way which was perhaps not intended is that I was called into an MDT meeting and I knew immediately that I walked in the room that it was bad news because you see seven or eight people sitting around all trying to look fairly casual and not do it. You, know, you think, hell's teeth, it's coming. And it, my surgeon then immediately said to him, well, he said, we've got this back, and uh, frankly, it, uh, it ain't grand. Well, it ain't great. But the, the, the inevitably, they have difficulty in, uh, in, in, in providing information uh, uh, like that. The other side of information, which is not quite so brilliant is that um, I, in Nottingham, where I'm being treated, that w although it's one NHS trust, there are three sites involved as the Queen's Medical Centre on the same site as that, but, but different from it is at the treatment centre and the oncology department is at the city hospital a few miles away. Um, which means that 
going from one to another, not everybody got the, the same up-to-date information. I mean, unfortunately, as you know, they've only spent £12 billion on the NHS IT system, so no wonder they can't get something down the, the line uh, rapidly. So that's something that sometimes has let them down, and it's not the fault of the people. Um, it's a, a strange one of that. I saw, when I was being screened, I saw this registrar at the treatment centre who was um, uh, 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 checking me over. And uh, I got home, and there was a letter, and I opened it, letter, and it was from this same registrar. And, I mean, the, the Royal Mail have pulled their fingers out, because you, know, you don't usually get quick. But the letter was computer-produced, and the computer had written, was writing to me and saying, so sorry you didn't turn up for your appointment last week. Um, you'll now have to start again, and we're referring, you were recopying in your GP and your oncologist. Now, it might seem just a cocker, but that's actually quite serious when something like that happens. Luckily, I picked it up, and I, I contacted her, and she, she was very apologetic. But obviously, she, thousands of these letters spewed out by the computer, which she, uh, which she signs. But in, in the main, um, information has been good. The other area where I have been involved with information which has been not good. Um, I was contacted by, I think, Gillian Nuttall. Somebody asked me if I was prepared to go and be interviewed on um, the Today, Today program on Radio 4, which I was, I was more than happy to do, and they, they interviewed me live uh, in the morning. What I hadn't realised was that the goalposts were in a slightly different place from where I thought, because although I'm stage four, um, I am on uh, the primary treatment of Vemurafenib, and they suddenly started talking about this new thing that was coming out, which was um, that there's a professor, someone who's developing an immuno uh, treatment prompted by viral injections. So it was really nothing to do with me, and I couldn't really comment that. So I had to try and manage that to say, well, it isn't really me, but this is potentially good news for, down the track for anybody that gets um, uh, diagnosed now. So I was able to get away with that. But then unfortunately, the, the TV people turned up later on. And they are like the, the dreaded, I'm sorry if I offend the people that read these papers, some of the papers like the Daily Mail, who every day, <laughs> you know, usually, I, think, I think what you can usually do is any, any headline in the Daily Mail, turn it into a question, and the answer is always no, because it's something like, will eating one tomato a day cure you of cancer? No. <laughs> because the next day it'll be, will eating one tomato a day kill you tomorrow? You no. Know, but the, the, the TV people, they were all they were interested in this vacuum. Sorry, I mustn't use un-PC language. But I only describe it as this vacuous bint that arrived. <laughs> and uh, she, she wanted to uh, interview me along this basis. That, Isn't this wonderful news and everybody's going to be cured tomorrow? Well, no. Um, and it is unfortunate that people get get quite the wrong impression, and um, I'm, I'm, I was anxious that I wasn't part of that in, in dis, deceiving people, because hope is great, but false hope um, is, is not a good idea. Um, so just referring back to the positive things, I've been very fortunate, because Vemir Afanib, um, I was given a pretty, pretty lousy uh, prognosis, but I started on that, as I said, in the beginning of October 2014, and now I'm on 23rd cycle, and I have managed to take that with very, I've been very lucky, I have very few side effects, can't go out in the sun much because it makes you very sensitive, but you can live with that. Um, I was getting very tired, and uh, so I talked with the professor, I said, well, shall we um, reduce the dose somewhat? So about a year ago, I reduced the dose to um, three quarters of what I was on, so I'm, and I'm still taking it. When I started in October, the, I had a CT scan in the December, and immediately the, the growth in the, in the muscle had shrunk. That in the spine, um, but there was no further growth, and there has been no further growth since. So I find, I, I find myself very, very, very fortunate uh, indeed. The other positives I've got um, are it seems funny, it's, it's bad news that you've, you've got a terminal illness, but in, in some ways it's good news because you've got time to think about things and sort things out and, uh, and enjoy life as far as we can. Um, 
I'm extremely fortunate because my wife, and she is my wife, she's not my carer, she hates being called my carer. She doesn't mind being called my bodyguard or something like that. But she is my wife and she is wonderful at um, sorting out little treats and we've done all sorts of things. We've been to Iceland and seen the um, uh, northern lights and seen whales and we've, that's with an H in, not, um, and uh, lots of other things and I continue to, uh, uh, to enjoy life. I've got supportive family and the joy of having grandchildren. Grandchildren are great young ones at getting they, 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 they tell it as it is, don't they? It's rather like if you said to them, um, what, do you think of, what do you think of mummy's hat for the wedding? And say, well, I don't like it. Whereas those of us who are a bit more experienced might say something a bit better. <laughs> By the way, don't say it looks fine, because that's the worst thing you can say. Um, but one of my sons was a bit upset after, the, and, and uh, my little four-year-old granddaughter said to him, Daddy, you're a bit upset. He said, yes. Yeah. Does that mean Grandpa's going to die? And he said, yes, but that's accepted uh, and done. I'm getting, I'm getting a red light here. Like, <laughs> you have it at conferences. What I was going to say was that uh, when I retired from work, um, I, uh, my wife came along and uh, I, I, I spoke, as I'm doing now. And uh, I was... Uh, I suppose I was in the position of having worked for an outfit for quite a long time, and I knew where a lot of the bodies were buried, and I, I couldn't resist this. And I said to her, I said, how long did I talk for then? About 10 minutes. She said, 43. So I won't keep you 43. <laughs> but what, I, what I, I shall do is say, the other thing is, I've got two or three pals who are on similar, in similar position to I am, and we're trying to outdo one another. And the deal is that the first one that gets up there uh, gets the round in. And the, 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 thing, the thing that's kept me going, I think, is trying to maintain my sense of humour. And I had to exercise that to the full again the other week. I sing with a, uh, a, a male voice choir, Norman and Well. Sure. Yeah, indeed, thank you, sir. And indeed, I should be singing, at, if I'm still here, at the Royal Albert Hall on, in, in, in October. And uh, one, of our, one of our chaps died, and uh, we, had his, we had his funeral in the, in the local cathedral, and we were singing there. And, uh, so we had the staging up, and who was going to stand where? Well, being a male voice choir, uh, there are a number of Welshmen in it. And one of them is, uh, his name is Di Roberts. And somebody said to me, well, there was somebody, Richard, you're next to Di. I said, well, uh, it might be true, it's a bit insensitive. Sorry, I've talked too long.